Hello, everyone. This was the talk that I gave at the Magic Workshop um, in La Jolla on February 28th. So first of all, thank you to the meeting organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk about our work. Uh, so in this talk, um, I will be discussing our new paleomagnetic constraints on plate tectonic motion and geodynamo activity in the early solar system and how we can achieve these results using magnetic imaging. So let's start with uh, geodynamos. So the geodynamo is really a ticket to uh, understand the interior of a planet by making measurements on its surface. So if we observe a dynamo um, generated magnetic field on a planetary surface, we know that it must have a liquid metallic core. And generally, it must have a relatively high heat flux coming out of the mantle and crust so that the, the core can be convecting. And if the core is compositionally convecting, uh, then that also lets us probe the composition of light elements in the core. So generally, it's a powerful tool for understanding planetary thermal history um, as well as, as composition. At the same time, uh, having a magnetic dynamo affects the surface environment, uh, mostly through its uh, mediation uh, of atmospheric loss. And this is a complicated relationship. Uh, magnetic fields can either enhance or impede uh, atmospheric erosion. Uh, and a number of recent studies have agreed on this general idea, but quantitatively, there is still a lot of uncertainty left. So just as a uh, example here, this is Gunau et al. 2018, and they show that um, uh, depending on the dipole moment of the planet compared to the different solar system planets. Um, the total atmospheric loss, this is ions and neutrals, can vary quite a bit um, uh, with some maxima here that corresponds to high loss in these polar cusps. But again, this is not the last word on this subject. Uh, and actually that I think gives us as paleomagnetists a window of opportunity here. Uh, if we can read the paleomagnetic record of dynamo activity on different planets. And we can correlate them with times of relatively uh, thick or thin atmosphere. Then that can actually test the relationship directly between the uh, magnetic fields and atmospheric loss. So people have tried to do this for Mars. Um, one of the most robust results from the, the orbital surveys of the Martian crustal magnetic field is that there are these large demagnetized zones corresponding to large impact basins. Uh, I'll mostly concentrate on this one here, the Hellas Basin, uh, which is the, the best dated and oldest of these, at least potentially oldest of these. Um, and this one is clearly non-magnetized compared to the, uh, the material surrounding it. And so people have hypothesized that this means that the dynamo on Mars had ceased um, operating by the time Hellas impact occurred at about 4.0 to 4.1 billion years ago. Uh, and so this impact basin cooled in the, in the lack of a global magnetic field. Uh, now, this is true. This has uh, implications actually uh, not just for the this, uh, lifetime of the dynamo, but also for water activity on Mars. And that's because the period of the most valley network formation, right, the, the most geological evidence uh, for, um, for a Martian uh, hydrosphere, occurs quite a bit later, a couple hundred million years after the, the Hellas impact. So if this chronology were true, then that would mean that the dynamo had died several hundred million years before a period of active hydrology. And so it would seem to suggest that it's not necessary to have an active dynamo to maintain a thick atmosphere um, and relatively high, uh, high water abundance on the surface of Mars. Uh, however, recent studies have called us into question. Uh, there's a, a, a recent study of uh, remote, remotely sensed magnetic fields um, that show that a younger volcanic complex called Lucas Planum at about 3.7 billion year old, years old appears to be magnetized. Uh, and looking at a paleomagnetic record, um, the, the famous meteor ALH-8411 has been studied several times uh, and most of these authors concluded that there was some kind of magnetic field at about 4.0 billion years ago. 
Um, there's some uh, ambiguities with these studies, however, um, and uh, a lot of it comes down to the complexity of ALH84001. If you look at the, uh, the meteorite at the grain scale, what you'll see is that there's two populations of magnetic minerals. There's magnetites hosted in carbonates that formed in a low temperature environment, aqueous alteration, and about 3.9 billion years ago. And then there are chromites uh, with iron sulfide or pyrotite that included in them that form igneously from a melt of 4.1 billion years ago. So far, there has been no systematic study of these chromite pyrotite inclusions uh, that includes full demagnetization and component fitting. Uh, so, so far, um, uh, we don't have a uh, full record of the of the paleomagnetic history of this meteorite all the way from 4.1. And so that's what we're trying to do here, obtain a paleomagnetic, paleomagnetic record from these chromite pyrotite assemblages um, that hopefully will give us a story uh, of the magnetic environment all the way back to 4.1 billion years ago. Um, the reason that it hasn't been done already, at least a big part of the reason, is basically that these, these inclusions are not separated by large distances. You can see they're maybe a millimeter apart in many cases. So um, uh, other techniques, uh, including even the squid microscope uh, with about 200 micrometer resolution, uh, can barely distinguish some of these, these larger sources, but they're basically all mixed together. So using the QDM, we can resolve individual sources and we can pick the ones uh, that have a more coherent signal uh, and, and interpret those. Uh, as you can see, the, the QDM is less sensitive than the squid microscope, uh, but in this case, these chromite um, pyrotide assemblages are quite strong, so that's not a problem. All right, so what we do here is pretty similar to many studies that use uh, either a squid microscope or the QDM. Uh, we pick an inclusion like this one. We map the magnetic field over the surface. When we take this raw map. We, we, we basically give it a, a low-pass filter called upper continuation uh, that isolates a dipole component of the field, and then we model it, and that gives us a, a vector direction and magnitude. And we do this while either heating or applying AF demagnetization. So this is that same source on the last slide. Uh, as we demagnetize it, this time using AF, you can see a, a very reasonable demagnetization pattern. And the, the dipole pattern here also goes away in the image. Uh, so this is the strongest source we found. Um, there's uh, There are many more sources that are, are a bit more noisy than this, but you can see still most of them, uh, they give reasonable demagnetization sequences that we can fit. And uh, the components also show up in thermal demagnetization as well. So in total, we found 11 sources, uh, 11 of these chromite uh, pyrotide assemblages that have a coherent high temperature or high coercivity magnetization. If we plot those high temperature, high coercivity magnetizations, uh, they plot in two clusters. And these clusters are statistically distinguishable from random at, at high confidence. Uh, both of these directions are, are distinguishable from the fusion crust as well. So uh, it passes the, the fusion crust bay contact test. Uh, and third, uh, we, we see another population of grains. Uh, there are not that many of these, uh, only four that we found. But basically, they are chromites where uh, the, the natural random magnetization doesn't look like much, doesn't have a coherent direction. But once you give it an ARM, even in a fairly low bias field, it lights up and shows a reasonable direction, in this case, to towards the 12 o'clock, uh, where the, the ARM bias field is pointing. Yeah, so uh, that, that means that these, uh, these chromite so, um, pyrotide assemblages are not magnetized, but it's not because they can't record a magnetic field. They're actually pretty good recorders. So uh, this shows that these particular sources must have been uh, demagnetized in a less than about six microtesla magnetic field. Right? If they were magnetized in a field stronger than this, then they should look like this. Um, their inner M should look like this and be coherent and have a, have a direction. All right, so we have these three different populations with different magnetic records. Uh, so how can you get this in a 
meteorite and with these sources only millimeters apart. Um, uh, I think the answer basically comes down to impact shocks. And this is an idea that has been proposed before, but we try to quantify this a bit more. Uh, we work with a group from Imperial College that, uh, that models heating, uh, mesoscale impact he heating in, in, um, on these grains. Uh, we actually use realistic uh, ALH8411 mineralogies. And what we find is that uh, depending on where you are in the meteorite, uh, the chromites can get heated up basically not at all, or if it's close to these uh, these regions of high heating, they can actually be heated to several hundred degrees, and so would record a um, record a thermal remnant magnetization. Um, and the, the key thing here is that the heating is very heterogeneous, so you can heat some of these chromite uh, pyrotite assemblages and not others in a single impact event. Now, so with that in mind, the question then becomes, when were the impact events, right? When could this meteorite have been partially remagnetized in this manner? Well, if we, um, if we look at this, this timeline, uh, we're fortunate that this meteorite is one of the most studied rocks in history, I think. And so people have dated uh, many events in it. So it crystallized from igneous melt uh, 4.1 billion years ago. And then there was what's called a D1 event, uh, which is this gigantic impact event that heated the whole rock up to at least 900 degrees Celsius. So as far as magnetics is concerned, this is time zero. This is the earliest possible TRM. And it's somewhere between 3.95 and 4.1 billion years ago. And then there was a D2 event, uh, which is another uh, milder impact shock, somewhere between 3.8 and 3.9 billion years ago, uh, that took the the, the whole rock up to a couple hundred degrees Celsius, but I, like I showed in the last slide, some local regions should have been heated to well above the Curie temperature pure type. And then there was an uh, even weaker D3 event that caused some localized heating, but did not heat the entire rock uh, substantially. Um, so if we keep in mind, there's three populations of, of uh, magnetic behavior um, in, this, in this meteorite and there are these three events. The most likely scenario, I think, is that these two strong uh, magnetizations uh, correspond to D1 or D2. We don't know which one's which. And then the, the field decayed away after this early dynamo uh, period. And then at D3 time, you had another event that demagnetized some small fraction of these, these uh, magnetic sources. Um, but even if you flip around the orders of these, right, um, of which population corresponds to which uh, deformation event, uh, there's at least one strong magnetic field in the early solar system in 3.9 to 4.0 billion years ago. Um, and if you take this, what I think is the most likely scenario, that both that these two strong magnetizations are from the early solar system, uh, then these very, uh, very highly separate directions uh, suggest that uh, there was a magnetic reversal going on on Mars. Now, it's possible, of course, that the, the rock or the boulder that this meteorite was in simply rotated 180 degrees. Um, but uh, the, the probability of that is, is relatively low, less than 20%. So the most likely scenario is that there was a magnetic reversal between these two magnetizations recorded at D1 and D2 time. Um, but again, in any case, there was some magnetic field um, at 4.0 billion years ago. And combined with the, the orbital data from Lucas Planum, I think we have a stronger case now that the Martian dynamo lasted well past 4.1 billion years ago. Uh, so that brings up this contradiction, right? So how come Hellas impact basin is demagnetized? if it formed in this presence of an active dynamo? Well, um, maybe the reversal part is, is, is critical. So uh, Sarah Steele, a graduate student in the group who also did the ALH uh, double one work, has been doing some finite element simulations of cooling of a giant basin like this. Uh, and it's uh, it takes a long time, hundreds of millions of years. So if you have reversals during this time, you can actually uh, um, uh, result in a very weak magnetic field. Uh, and, in this example for um, the high reversal case, uh, you, you're missing this long wavelength 
a magnetic signal, which is what you would be picking up if you're in orbit. When we can see this as a uh, just a relationship between reversal rate and the magnetic field at orbital altitudes, uh, as you can see, once you get past about two reversals per million years, uh, you're looking at uh, fields, orbital altitude fields that are about an order of magnitude weaker than if the basin cooled in a constant field. And it, it kind of levels off here. It doesn't go down anymore. And that's because this, this region here, right in the middle, is actually very quickly cooled. And it's actually going to record a pretty strong field no matter what. But still, this signal is about an order of magnitude less than if the whole thing cooled in a constant field. All right, so the takeaway here is that um, if there was a reversing dynamo, then there's no real contradiction here. Hellas Basin could have formed in the presence of such a dynamo without being strongly magnetized, at least as seen from orbital altitudes. So the conclusion here um, is that the Martian dynamo was probably active until 3.9 to 3.7 billion years ago. Uh, and it's difficult to maintain that, uh, that dynamo for that long without um, some special conditions, right? either a hot early core or maybe composition convection in the in the early core. So it places some constraints on Mars's thermal history. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, reversals, uh, which we we think is the most likely explanation for the data, would also in, imply a, a very narrow range of Rayleigh numbers in the early core. So that, again, constrains the thermal history. And in terms of the, the surface conditions, the Martian dynamo is active uh, during the hydrologically active epoch. Um, so this uh, is consistent with, but does not require that uh, the Martian dynamo actually shielded the atmosphere and maintained the water on, on Mars at that time. Um, at the same time, it also, also uh, implies that if the dynamo was actually contributing not to preservation, but to erosion of the atmosphere, that this erosion was not dramatically efficient. Right? It was not so efficient that the, that the atmosphere was depleted during this several hundred million years of active dynamos be before the valley network formation period. Now, uh, switching to the, to the second part of this talk about plate tectonics. Uh, so like I said, uh, magnetic core dynamo tells us a lot about the thermal history of a planet. Um, it's the same is true for uh, mobile lid uh, plate tectonics. Right? If there are plate tectonics on a planet, that means that, well, there needs to be mantle convection. It needs to have a relatively thin lithosphere that's able to bend and, and be broken. And also, uh, uh, Subduction is the most efficient way to deliver volatiles, especially water, into the upper, upper mantle, not upper atmosphere. Um, and that lowers uh, the mantle viscosity and increases mantle convection further. So overall, mobile lid tectonics implies a high planetary heat flux um, over a, for example, a stagnant lid, stagnant lid regime. Um, and just as importantly, I think, uh, um, mobile lid tectonics has important implications for the surface environment. Um, so most famously, uh, uh, subduction is believed to be a regulator of atmospheric CO2 on long time scales so through this silicate weathering feedback, where carbonates um, are subducted into the mantle and draws down CO2 from the atmosphere. And it's not just about temperature, but also the actual flux of CO2 and other light elements. Uh, so most um, simulations have shown that a stagnant lid regime is most likely uh, um, less efficient at providing volatiles into the into the surface environment. Uh, so in, in, so these these little circles here are, are simulations in, of a stagnant lid world, stagnant lid Earth, uh, with different types of parameters uh, uh, during Archean time. So you should compare these data points or these simulation points to this band here, which is the projected CO2 flux from a plate tectonic early world, early Earth. And you can see there's something like a couple of hours magnitude difference. Um, and finally, it's not just about what comes up, but also what goes down. 
um, uh, topography is the is a strong control on continental weathering and erosion, and plate tectonics is the the main driver of topography um, on on the modern Earth. So. Uh, according to this model, for example, uh, if topography developed early versus later in the in the history of the Earth, the amount of phosphorus being weathered into the, the oceans is dramatically different, at least for, for some stretch of time. So that has uh, you know, severe implications for, for example, the, the primary productivity of the oceans. Uh, but the point here is that whether or not plate tectonics is really key for habitability, as it has been proposed to be, um, uh, it's still very important for the biosphere, right? So even if life form is stagnant lit Earth, if the planet transitions into a, a plate tectonic regime, it fundamentally reshapes the, flu the fluxes of elements in the biosphere um, and how it develops. All right, so we really want to understand when plate tectonics initiated on Earth and how it, or and when it it forced these uh, these transitions. So recent geochemical um, proxies have been published that suggest plate tectonic initiation anywhere between three and even before 3.7 billion years ago, so a big range. Uh, and what we want to do here is look at the, the paleomagnetic record. Uh, and that's actually right in the middle of this, this region with a very large uh, gap in the, in the paleomagnetic uh, record between about 2.8 to 3.4 billion years ago. So uh, we undertook some field work uh, in Australia, in the Pilbara Craton, to uh, quantify plate motion uh, in the middle of this, this gap. So we think 3.3 and 3.2 billion years ago. We did two field seasons there. Um, most of this work was led by uh, Alec Brenner here, graduate student. Um, see some really nice looking comadiites there. Uh, just jumping right into the data here, in the 2018 field season, we sampled the Kunaguna Arena formation, which are meta, meta, uh, meta basalts and meta uh, has It has a long and complicated magnetic history. You can see many, many components here. Um, but uh, the, the main one we're focusing on, of course, is the, the high temperature component. And if we plot the the high temperature component directions at the site level here, we can see, so first of all, um, these two clusters on two, well, not really limbs of the fold, but two parts of, of, of a limb of a fold. Uh, when you tilt correct, it comes together, right? So it's a shallow angle fold test, but it, it nonetheless does pass the fold test statistically. Um, and at the same time, you also notice there's some reverse directions right, relative to these, uh, these um, this other cluster. Okay, so the main point here is that we're passing a fold test and the age of folding is about 2.93 billion years ago. So we asked the question that uh, every Precambrian paleomagnetic study is, is obsessed with. Um, what is the age of demagnetization? So it needs to be older than 2.93 billion years ago because of this fold test. Uh, but that still leaves us a 300 million year old window where this magnetization may have been formed, uh, might have been remagnetized. Um, so we know it's not thermally remagnetized, and that's just wrote out by the metamorphic grade uh, because it's only lower green shift spaces. However, we can't rule out chemical remagnetization based on this data alone. Now, if we look at um, the, the samples at the grain scale, that actually gives us a lot more information. So Alec uh, used the QDN to map the sources of magnetic signal in this rock. And what you can see here, a lot of it is actually coming from these secondary phases. Uh, so these are generations of secondary phases. This is actually a vesicle. So this is in, these are infill phases. And you can see there's lots of magnetite formed in this, um, in this, uh, this region of the altered vesicle. So what we're seeing here is a, a chemical remnant, right? It's not a primary igneous uh, uh, assemblage here. Uh, but actually that might not be a problem. In fact, that can help us uh, because that gives us context to when the magnetization formed. Uh, so we can look at the, the progression of minerals in this vesicle and we can see that it follows this, this uh, well-established sequence with magnetite here in, this, in the second generation. 
And this sequence is exactly what you expect from a VHMS system or a volcanically hosted massive sulfide deposit. And these are um, systems where a shallow intrusion or a heat source sets up convection right beneath the, uh, the ocean floor in the top kilometer or two. So we know the context, right, the, the geologic setting of this, of the formation of these minerals, and by extension, the acquisition of, mag of magnetization in these magnetites. Um, so that alone tells us that it was probably it probably happened fairly soon after emplacement because the, these VHMS systems are relatively shallow. But we can do even better than this. We can actually look at some phases in here that we can directly date. Uh, and fortunately, we have one here in the form of titanite, have these big titanite grains that contain uranium and lead. Okay, so just to, to talk a little bit about how to read the, the uh, Concordia diagram here for titanite. So, yeah, so if you have a zircon, right, that's concordant uh, with no initial lead and no lead loss, um, then it should plot on this nice Concordia line, right, um, in this space. And where, where it is on this line gives you the age. Um, so titanite is, is not as cool as zircon. Um, so instead of zero initial lead, typically it has initial lead. So instead of a point here on the Concordia, you get this array. And then if you have lead loss, um, then you shift the whole array to the, to the right here, just in the case of zircon. So the real formation age here is, is really determined by this initial lead array and where it intersects Concordia. Uh, you can kind of tell this by the left edge of these cloud of data and also the, the, the lower part here of this, this kind of barrier. Um, all right, so this is the actual data uh, from the Kunigunda Arena formation titanites. And we can see we, have, we can fit these two arrays here. Um, and that implies formation at uh, 3.2 to uh, plus or minus 0.2, or 0.02 rather, um, billion years. Um, and this age is exactly um, concordant, or uh, congruent, I should say, with the age of a known, uh, a known intrusion event in the, in the region. It's called a Cleveland super suite. Uh, that has uh, an age of 3.25 uh, billion years ago. Okay, so we can be quite confident from characterizing the, the magnetic mineralogy and then dating this alteration sequence that formed those minerals uh, that the magnetization dates for 3.25 billion years ago. All right, so that's great. Now for all of this, we have an age. Um, all right, so we can reconstruct the apparent polar wander path uh, for from the East Pilbara craton. Uh, these two are the data points we got from the 2018 and 2017 field seasons. And then this is a pre-existing study on the Euro basalt uh, from, from Bradley et al. Uh, putting this all together, even the most conservative case, right? Because you don't know the polarities of these, so you have to kind of entertain some different models. But even in the most conservative case, there is at least 0.55 degree per year. Or sorry. Sorry, this is per million year. Uh, <laughs> uh, per year, uh, 0.5 degree per million year uh, of motion, uh, which is on the higher side of modern plate motion, but not, not exceedingly high. Uh, it is higher than, uh, than net rotations, uh, so a single plate moving over the mantle velocities, both for the present day as well as for modeled net rotation velocities in the Archean Earth. And also based on the geometries of these two rotations, and the, the implied longitude of the true polar wander axis, if it is true polar wander, uh, it, it, it's likely not true polar wander because that would require the true, true polar wander axis to change um, in only a few tens of millions of years, which we haven't observed in, in later geologic history. So overall, the, uh, I think we're, we're quite confident that there was mobile lead plate tectonic motion at 3.25 billion years ago. All right, just to summarize everything here, um, the Martian dynamo, uh, according to our ALH 84 double one paleomagnetism, lasted until at least 3.9 billion years ago, likely undergoing reversals. Uh, and that means that there was an active dynamo during the wet Noyakian epoch, right, when the valley networks were forming. And that's consistent with magnetic shielding of, of the atmosphere, although, again, it doesn't require 
but it is a very important data point going forward as we try to understand the effect of uh, magnetism on the atmosphere. And uh, plate tectonics on Earth, initiated by at least 3.25 billion, year, billion years ago, that pushes it back from about 400 million years. Uh, and um, there was also a mostly dipolar reversing dynamo by that time, as seen by our reversals. So overall, a geo geophysically mature Earth by 3.25 billion years ago. And on a more technical note, uh, what we find here is that the, the QDM is able to uh, access types of magnetic carriers that we normally wouldn't be able to measure due to their small size, as in the case of the chromite pyrotite assemblages in the Martian meteorite. And also, even when we're, when we're using more traditional samples like oriented cores, uh, the QDM gives us a lot of mineralogical context and help us understand the origin of the signal. And that's all I have to say here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so again, this is recorded after the fact, so there are no, no questions. Um, but I'll, I'll take the liberty to repeat the questions that were asked as far as I can remember. So uh, last, um, I guess, two Mondays ago on, on February 28th, um, people asked about uh, whether there are enough magnetic sources in these chromite pyrotide assemblages to really record a direction. And the answer, I think, is yes. Uh, if you just look at these moments, they're actually pretty high. They're 10 to the minus 11 m meter squared, 10 to the minus 8 EMU. Uh, so yeah, this is like a weak core on the 2G. Um, and this is the strongest one. But even the other ones, you know, there are a couple orders of magnitude above the threshold where you're running into statistical um, issues, right? Not being a, there not being enough grains. Uh, also, there was a question about uh, tilt correction, right? If we're looking at a CRM in uh, in these rocks, how do we know that is that that the the tilt correction based on the the volcanics themselves is correct? Uh, and there's there's a lot of sediments actually. Uh, both overlying the Kunigunda Arena formation and uh, the honey drip basalt. Uh, and it's actually, uh, you know, you can trace the stratigraphy uh, across this 2 point, or sorry, 3.25 to 3.18 billion year old window continuously. Uh, so there was clearly no rotation at that time because everything is, is subparallel. Uh, that's that's all I can remember. But okay, um, yeah. Thank you very much for listening to the recorded version of this talk. I'll leave it on the conclusions a little bit more.